I'm going to come out here if it's OK. Can you hear me way back there? So thank you all so much for spending this time with me. I, 16 years ago, I was a fresh-faced young man. I walked into the World Bank to work there for the first time. Uh, I was just back from living and working here, Santa Cecilia, Colombia, on an agricultural development project. I was impatient for development. Uh, the director of external relations for the World Bank gave us an orientation session on the first day, and he said something that shocked me. He said, you know, the fundamental purpose of this institution for most of its history, the reason that skeptical donors have supported it at the base has been communist containment, in those words. Now, this was 1996, so that reason was already fading. The whole aid world needed a new rationale. It needed a, a way to explain itself to voters. And four years later, it got that from uh, this group. This is the Millennium Summit here in New York City, 2000, the largest ever gathering of heads of state came together, Bill Clinton and Tariq Aziz in the same room, uh, to issue the Millennium Development Goals, a set of global, quantitative, time-bound targets for development. Group pledge to do things like cut poverty in half by 2015, get all young children into school by 2015. Now here we are, 2015 is around the corner, the Millennium Development Goals are about to expire, and the, the central vision, the guide star of foreign aid is up for grabs. You guys are going to shape that. And I, I want to put forward that there are, broadly speaking, two big social movements that are competing for your support. Um, the first of these you might call the goals movement. So this emerged from the OECD. They were the ones who pr proposed the proto-Millennium Development Goals, the United Nations and the NGO community in the mid to late 1990s. And uh, in, again, very broadly speaking, sketching, this, uh, this movement is characterized by the view that development is a process of scaling known solutions. If we know how to educate children. That's something people figured out a long time ago. We know how much it costs to educate a child. And Educating all children in the world is a matter of spreading that known solution globally. Uh, because we know what to do and because we have the money, any failure to meet this goal is a moral one. It means we didn't have the moral fiber to stand up and do it. Uh, there's a focus on external inputs, resources as a sufficient condition for change. And accountability is murky. Accountability is opaque. The Millennium Development Goals are silent on the issue of exactly what country, agency, or person is responsible for meeting them, or who will be held to account if they are not met. Now, there, there's an alternative movement uh, that you might call the evaluation movement, lots of names for it, that has also arisen over the last decade and a half. It has come primarily from academia, from parts of the World Bank and elsewhere. It's, uh, it's embodied today in places like Development Innovation Ventures at USAID, the Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT, uh, the International Institute for Impact Evaluation, and the World Bank's DIME initiative. And in the evaluation movement, uh, humility is the order of the day. Uh, the focus is on testing questions, trying lots of things, failing a lot of the time, clearly identifying and surviving failures, pushing resources towards things that seem to work well, pushing resources away from things that seem not to work well. And because of that, failure is not a moral issue. It's actually required. It's not optional. It's a welcome sign that learning is happening. Uh, the focus is on local outcomes as a sufficient condition for development happening. And accountability is clear. A lot of the discussion in the evaluation movement revolves around how to figure out exactly who caused exactly what or exactly who did not cause exactly what. Now, here's one way to uh, describe the difference between these movements. In the goals movement, and this is the, the central metaphor of Professor Jeffrey Sachs' book, The End of Poverty, poor places are like sick people. 
They're like patients. Aid workers like physicians. Physicians have a range of known pre-tested solutions, and the challenge lies in a proper diagnosis, having the moral fiber to act, and getting the resources to do it. And once the sickness is cured, it's cured. People go on with their lives. Um, in the evaluation movement, uh, development is nothing like that. It's, it, you might think of it more like uh, a young family trying for the first time to do things they never did before, like uh, raise a child to adulthood or build a trusting relationship. The first time they do these things, nobody really knows how to do them. They make a lot of mistakes. Uh, people in a family who mess up are held to account for it. And over time, iteratively and continuously, never ending really, as long as there's a family, they figure out uh, things to do. Um, outsiders can help. Outsiders can inspire. They can suggest things for you. But unlike physicians, they can't actually do anything. They can't, no outsider can raise your children for you. No outsider can fix your marriage. Um, now, why do I say that these movements compete for your support? Why can't it be that they complement each other? The uh, goals people raise the money, the evaluation people figure out what to do with it, and everybody works together. What, what I want to assert today is that these movements conflict as they currently exist and that it's not coherent to fully support both of them as they exist now. And to, to argue for that, I, I want to tell you about a personal experience of mine, which was critiquing the evaluation strategy of the Millennium Villages Project. So it's, it's come up, I think a lot of you know what the Millennium Villages Project is. It is a uh, multi-sector, intensive, short-term package aid intervention going on right now in 14 village clusters across Africa started eight years ago in Kenya and Ethiopia. It's on track to spend about $100 million. Uh, it's being run by the United Nations and Columbia University. And uh, it, uh, it, it intervenes in, in what Professor Sachs termed the big five areas, agriculture, education, health, water sanitation, and infrastructure, simultaneously with the idea, uh, the core principle being that uh, the whole will be greater than the sum of the parts. Now, this uh, project has gotten very high-level support. Here's Ban Ki-moon pumping water at the Mwandama cluster in uh, Malawi. And it's made, from the outset, absolutely extraordinary claims of what it could do. So here are some statements from 2003, 2004, when the project was just getting going about what this project could accomplish. Uh, it's, it said that it, it was a solution to extreme poverty. That, uh, that's a little hard to read, I'm sorry. That, uh, uh, that, that it could cause uh, isolated, very poor villages in Africa to by themselves meet these global millennium development goals. That they would do this by achieving self-sustaining economic growth. That this would happen in five years time and most notably that the effect would be sustained. That is, this would involve breaking villages free from poverty traps, which necessarily implies that the effects would go on and on after the, the, uh, this intensive burst of aid uh, stopped. Now, here we are in 2012, fast forward eight years. How did it work out? Um, did we see self-sustaining economic growth? Have we seen uh, poverty cut in half uh, at the sites in five years' time. So the founder and director of the project in, in The Guardian says the project is not just successful, but enormously successful. So I would think that some of those stated goals must have happened, and we should have evidence about that. So here is the evidence uh, brought to bear to support that conclusion. Uh, the evidence is that a lot of positive changes have occurred at the sites in several social indicators. For example, the fraction of births attended by skilled health personnel, doctors and nurses, has gone up. Now, from the standpoint of the goals movement, this is sound. This is a, this is a sound communication. It's true. I have no reason to doubt that that fact is true. 
and it is something to feel quite good about, that progress has happened toward these goals. From the standpoint of the evaluation movement, and I say this with sadness, this is a masterpiece of misrepresentation and opacity. Because they are not telling you several things that are critical to know to properly interpret these numbers. First of all, a large part of many of these changes they're describing, changes in vaccinations, schooling, access to clean water, and skilled health personnel, are happening all across the regions they're working in, all across the countries they're working in, because this is a, a time of stability and prosperity for most of the countries where they're working. Uh, thank heavens. So here's an example. Skilled birth attendants that we just looked at in Bonsaso, Ghana, one of the early uh, uh, Millennium Village sites in the Ashanti region. Skilled birth attendance has improved quite a lot there over in, the, in three years of the period that the project has been working. And the project describes this as an impact achievement or result of its work. What they don't tell you is that this exact same indicator has been improving quite a lot all around the project. This is the rural areas of Ashanti region. Bonsasso comprises about 1% of the population of Ashanti. Now, it could be that progress in the Millennia Village is a little faster, and I'm glad to see that. I would love any woman who wants her birth to be attended by skilled health personnel to have that available. But to claim uh, that all or even most of the change at the site um, is the impact, result, achievement of the project is just indefensible in light of this evidence. This goes on with several other indicators too. Here is child malnutrition, a, a stunting an indicator of chronic malnutrition among children under two years old, falling a lot at the Bonsasso site, something that's wonderful news, also described as a, an impact achievement result of the project. Here is how the exact same indicator has been changing uh, in the rural areas of Ashanti region. And it might have helped to some degree, but this evidence is just not compatible for any reasonable, independent, disinterested observer with the heroic statement that the, the, the project caused the decline at the site. Now, what about those, uh, those economic impacts that we were talking about before? Um, is this project creating economic value? That is, is it an economic development strategy as the, as the project asserts, or is the project destroying economic value? That is, is it, is it a charity? Is it giving money to get social outcomes that may or may not have an economic value in the future, something that I consider perfectly legitimate? I don't criticize charity. Um, the project says explicitly it's not charity. So in order to assess that statement, we would need to know how much does all of this cost and what's the economic benefit. Unfortunately, we can't do that because there is no transparent information about how much it all costs and what the economic benefits are. On the cost side, the project has issued uh, a, a wide range, actually, of estimates of the per capita expenditure at the sites. You can get that. What you can't get is, a, is an easy to interpret transparent accounting of the full cost of everything, including travel, consultants, uh, uh, unpaid uh, time, uh, by experts, uh, office space in New York, in-kind contributions from corporate partners, all of that together. That's hard to find out. The benefit side is even harder because in the eight years of its existence, this project has not released data on what has happened to incomes at the sites. You're going to hear the only information that's been collected and publicly released on that subject from Bernadette, who had to collect it herself. The project did not, uh, uh, has not released any of that information. So uh, recently, for the first time, it's actually possible to look into this subject a little further because the UK government is funding a new Millennium Village site in Ghana, far north of Bonsasso, near the border in Upper East region. Um, and the, uh, the UK government has certain transparency rules. So some of the documents to make some of these interesting calculations are online and you can look them up yourself. I'm gonna show you a screenshot from the business plan for this Millennium Village, which is based on the eight years of experience written by the project and is based on the eight years of experience that they've had. The full cost of this project, as you can see, is $27.1 million over five years in direct costs. What is the poverty reduction economic growth goal of this project? 
the Millennium Village aims to achieve substantial poverty reduction for up to 2,250 households. And you've all got calculators in your cell phones. I don't need to tell you that this is $12,000 per household lifted out of poverty. $12,000. And I want to point out that in the latest Living Standards Measurement Survey in Upper East Ghana, household income per year is 360 US dollars. Again, with the calculator, you can see that this project is executing a one-time present value expenditure of 33 times local incomes per year to lift families out of poverty. Now, is that creating economic value or is it destroying economic value? Um, another way to look at this is that you could take that $12,000, put it in the bank, and just on the interest, just on 5% interest, without ever touching the principal, you could permanently, certainly, triple everybody's income who they're targeting to lift out of poverty. Now, can the project do that? I'm skeptical, I don't know, because the project has not released any information about what's happened to incomes at the rest of the sites. Um, another, uh, uh, another critical issue is that, remember the, those statements about the sustained impact, self-sustaining economic growth, breaking free of poverty traps, those are inherently long-term claims. And yet, they make them based on an evaluation that has only happened while these expenditures have been flowing enormous expenditures relative to the local economy. And something that my co-author and I pointed out, which is just logic, in my opinion, is that those statements can't be evaluated while the money is flowing. You have to evaluate the claim that effects are sustained during the period that they're supposed to be sustained, that is, after the money uh, stops. And the, the project's reaction to this recommendation, I find illuminating. Here's what they said. This assertion cannot be taken seriously. It would be the height of folly to delay. Economists like Clemens and Demombin should stop believing that the alleviation of suffering must wait, needs to wait, for their cluster-controlled randomized trials. Now, from the point of view of the goals movement, this makes perfect sense. This is reasonable. If you see yourself as taking to scale things that are absolutely known to work and somebody is standing in the way of you alleviating suffering, they're promoting suffering. And that's ethically problematic, as this statement suggests that, uh, that we are. From the standpoint of the evaluation movement, this statement is nonsense. It's nonsense. Taking, diverting enormous resources away from other users, uses to a project based on claims that have not been evaluated and can't be evaluated, you can't evaluate long-term impacts with a short-term evaluation, is not just problematic. I would even go further than that. I would suggest that it has ethical implications. And the reason is that aid money has always been scarce, is scarce, and always will be scarce, diverting it massively to an intervention whose claims are, are supported only by confident assertions takes it away from things that are known to work, like the polio eradication campaign, or things that could be transparently shown to work. And that, I consider ethically problematic. Now, uh, sitting in this room, you might conclude that the fresh-faced young man who worked in Santa Cecilia, Colombia, has turned into a bitter old man. <laughs> and you might be right about that. But uh, actually, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm more hopeful than that. I think that this could be done a lot better, and I think that you could be part of it, which is why I, I'm here to talk to you today. Uh, I have a lot of reasons to be hopeful. So one is, as I said, the Millennium Development Goals are expiring. For the second time in the, in, in the history of foreign aid, really, uh, the, the, the central guiding principle of foreign aid is up for grabs. You could shape that. You could be part of a new movement. Um, a second thing that makes me hopeful, and this has been a, a, a discussed uh, fascinatingly by Yao, is that there are all kinds of new tools available to you that were not available when some of you were in diapers when they were formulating these goals. Uh, I'm talking about big data, open data, new technologies, uh, more frequent household surveys, new analytical tools for establishing causal relationships that just weren't around at that time. 
and these things can make impact much more transparent than ever before. Um, a third reason I'm hopeful is that the presidency of the World Bank is open. Now the World Bank has been on both sides of this divide. Historically, factions in the World Bank have pushed the goals movement. Factions of the World Bank have been leaders in the evaluation movement. And really, the, the institution, as, a, as one of the main leaders of the aid movement, could go either way. And uh, a, a new president with uh, a humility and a, an interest in transparent data could really take it forward in a great direction, I think. Um, a fourth reason I'm hopeful is that this is an age of fiscal austerity. When the goals movement began in the mid-1990s, the order of the day was huge fiscal surpluses. Some of you are old enough to remember that. They were wondering what to do with all of the money. The world is totally different now, and I think that voters might be interested in some of the things that the evaluation movement has to say about uh, clearly establishing transparent causal relationships. And the, the final reason I'm really hopeful is, is seeing all of you here. The, the reason that the fact that you showed up means that you're willing to intellectually engage with these debates, decide for yourself what movement to support, and then go do something about it. And for that, I'm extremely grateful. Thanks.